look in your bulletin, you may notice that I am not Pastor Marius Serbe. <laughs> For those of you that don't know me, my name is Tom Clark. Uh, I am a member here. We are uh, infrequent attenders. We go to other churches as well. But anyway, um, this morning, you know, what I want to speak to you about really was kind of inspired by Barbara Hagley's sermon on mingling. How many of you remember that a few weeks ago? And uh, this is something that uh, I would like to uh, maybe expand on. And along the lines of the uh, pastor's uh, current studies on uh, the life of Jesus and uh, who Jesus was, what he stood for, and so forth, uh, I wanted to expand on that just a little bit. Before we get started, if we could bow our heads for a little word of prayer. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, we're, we're thankful, Lord, for all the many blessings that you give us each day. We're thankful for this opportunity to explore dimensions of your being, explore dimensions of what you would have us to do as, as your followers. Be with us now, Lord. Draw close to us and bless us all for having been here. This I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Christian, what really does that mean after all? Now this is taken out of a dictionary. One who professes belief in Jesus as Christ or follows a religion based on the life and teachings of Christ. One who lives in, according, in accordance to the teaching of Jesus. That's, those are nouns, by the way. Christian is a noun. Okay. What about from the adjective standpoint? Professing belief in Jesus as Christ or following the religion based on the life and teaching of Jesus? Relating to or derived from Jesus or Jesus' teaching? Manifesting the qualities or spirit of Jesus, especially in showing concern for others, and relating to or characteristic of Christianity or its adherents. Now, examples. Look around the room. Lee, you are a Christian. Noun. We do a good deed for our fellow man. Whoa. That was a Christian thing to do. You see the difference, okay? One is a statement of fact, the other is an action. Now, this is the perception, however. What is a Christian? The answer to the question, what is a Christian, will vary greatly depending upon whom you ask. To some, it means you were born in a Christian nation or you come from a Christian family. To others, it means you believe in Jesus or the religion that is based on Jesus' teaching. Yet others use the word Christian to speak of a deep personal relationship with Jesus, between Jesus Christ and an individual. Now, what's the biblical definition, however? Since the Bible is the authority for the Christian faith, let's see what it says about the word Christian. The word is used only three times in the New Testament, and, each in, and in, each, in each instance is referring to the first Christians in the early church. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were first called Christians First, in Antioch, this is in Acts 11:26. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? That's in Acts. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Peter said this. They were called Christians because of their behavior, their activity, and speech were like Jesus Christ. The word Christian means follower of Christ or belonging to the party of Christ. 
So what made them part of this group called Christians? Titus 3, 3 to 6 says this. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Ephesians says this and explains a little further. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So, how did Jesus sum up the whole of his teachings and commandments? We find this in Matthew. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he puts a footnote. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. If you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Now, in another spot, I think it's maybe in the book of John, Jesus said that I would have that my followers be known to all men that they love one another. Now, Joe and Pat, Heather, or Karen, excuse me, do you remember in the old PB Valley uh, Church, occasionally there would be missionaries that would come through. And these people would tell us about their adventures. And they would talk about the things that they had seen and the wonderful miracles that they had seen and all the exotic places that they had been. And as a little kid, I used to think, wow, that would be really, really cool. Someday I'd like to do that. But life gets in the way sometimes, and you never really had, I never had an opportunity, you know, to do mission service as such. And then what happened was the International Service Learning Project at the University of Louisville. Back in the late 90s, this project was conceived by the Vice President for Student Affairs, uh, Dr. Denise Gifford, and one of my colleagues, a guy by the name of Dr. Price Foster, who was a Justice Administration professor. And I was invited to participate in this program. Now, some fine print here, but let me kind of read this to you. This International Service Learning Program is a collaborative project where the university works directly with communities in a different country to help solve complex challenges within that community. ISLP is a four-credit course that enables students attending U of L an opportunity to gain international experience while assisting another country. Students enroll in one of five courses each semester, develop an interdisciplinary specific project, learn about a specific country, train for on-location activities, study country-specific cultures, and then travel to the location. While in country, the students work with local leaders in completing the projects. These projects are developed based upon the feedback provided from the representatives of the country <clears throat> and could include university students working with teachers and schools, government agencies, villages or towns, police, engineering agencies, hospitals, clinics, or any other opportunity that may be identified by that community. 
U of L has maintained this program since 1997. The first program was held at Barbados, and since 1997, the program has been in several locations throughout Belize. The Belize program was once as large as 87 delegates, but in the past two years, it has uh, been deliberately reduced in size and is now limited to 40 delegates, which includes 32 students and eight faculty and staff. The students may have majors in any discipline, Courses are offered in communication, education, justice administration, nursing, college student, personnel, higher learning, education, business, sport, administration, civic leadership, and dentistry. The ISL program was formed in 1996, as we said, when uh, Vice President for Student Affairs, Dr. Denise Gifford, contacted Dr. J. Price Foster, a professor from the Justice Administration Department, to partner in this collaborative outreach. Now, we have worked in Barbados, we have worked in several locations in Belize, Belmopan, Gales Point, Dangriga, Punta Gorda, Red Bank. We have worked in Cebu, in the, island of the, in the uh, Philippine Islands. We've worked in Bridgetown, Barbados, uh, Haveroni in Botswana, uh, Charlottesville in Trinidad and Tobago, and Sishak, Croatia, and most recently, uh, we've uh, started working in Ghana. The faculty for the program has grown from three to over 23 professors and staff representing 13 different departments and six college divisions. These programs vary in size and time offered each year. Belize and Trinidad and Tobago travel over spring break and include delegations of 40 and 25 respectively. Botswana travels during May with the delegation of 30, and the Philippines travels during the winter break with a delegation of 20. Now, Allie, where is she? You are going to have a good time. You are going to have a great time. And I just want to illustrate just a small facet of what you're in for. Okay? Now, let's let this adventure begin. Belize. How many know where Belize is? Okay. How many of you know it's not an island? Okay. It's not an island. It's a country, okay, that's on the mainland. Now, Belize used to be called British Honduras. It got its independence in 1981 from the British Commonwealth. It has a parliamentary form of government. It still is headed at least in title, by the Queen of England. However, the last time the Queen visited Belize was in 1976. So, anyways, not exactly what you would call a front-line representative of the United Kingdom. It's bounded on the north by Mexico and on the south by Guatemala, and there are many islands along the coast. Indeed, the, uh, the reef is uh, one of the great reefs in the world. Uh, they call these... The, the way it's pronounced is uh, keys. They call it kais, but uh, keys is what, what it means. And Belize and its keys are sheltered by the second longest barrier, or second largest barrier reef in the world. The largest is the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. And uh, this is uh, a truly a spectacular part of the world for uh, uh, sport fishing and for snorkeling and diving and so forth. Now, the territory's greatest length is from the north to south, about 280 kilometers, and its width is 109 kilometers. It's almost the same size as the state of Connecticut. If you've ever been to Connecticut, it's a small state. It's about that same size. The climate is subtropical. It's about 80 degrees on average, okay, which is pretty pleasant, but I will tell you sometimes it's really hot, and sometimes it drops down to about 60 now, I don't know about you, but 80 to 60 is kind of a nice comfort range. I like that a lot. The estimated population is around 300,000. Now, that varies depending upon who you talk to. Most recently, I think I've seen a figure somewhere in the neighborhood of 350,000. It's composed primarily of Creole. These are folks that are from African descent. Mestizo, Spanish or, or mine, and Garifuna, the Caribs. There are also a number of people of Spanish and East Indian descent. Ethnic groups are heavily intermixed. 
And there's also a small Mennonite community. Religion. About 62% of are Roman Catholic, at least nominally. Other religions include Baptists, Methodists, Seventh-day Adventists, and other various Protestants. Some other stuff. The official language, official language is English. However, a lot of people speak Spanish, and there's a whole bunch of different dialects that are really fascinating when you get into them. The currency is the Belizean dollar, which is equivalent to 50 cents of the U.S. dollar. In other words, it takes two Belizean dollars to uh, equal one American dollar. The health, uh, it, relatively free of, of endemic diseases, although HIV has become uh, increasingly common uh, in Belize in recent years. There's a few hospitals around and some private doctors. Now, this last item I think is particularly impressive, though. Their literacy rate is 93%. Does anybody care to guess what the literacy rate of the United States is? 84%. Most recent figures, 84%. So these people read better than we do. Go figure. Now, who is the least of these? Let me give you a little bit of background. The International Service Learning Program, because it's sponsored by a secular university, we tend to not get into religious stuff, okay? Religious overtones. We're not there to proselyte anybody. And because of this, we have an opportunity to work with governments, both uh, national governments and local governments as well. And it's proven to be a good model. And the modus operandi is usually we visit a country and we sit down with government officials and we say, what do you think? How can we help? Now, we're not in the, the, the business of providing lots of money and material stuff. We're more in the business of what we would call intellectual capital, to teach people how to do for themselves, to use their resources and how best to do for themselves. Now, along the way, we do contribute a lot. And what I want to show you is just one small facet of it this morning. When I first started going down to Belize, I took Betty with me on, on our first trip, and we were all over the country. And if you want to get an earful, let her tell you sometime about that grand adventure. Uh, it was very primitive at that time, and the main north-south road through the country was a dirt track. Uh, there were potholes that would eat a school bus. And uh, anyway, we had to get around by air. Uh, we chartered uh, uh, aircraft, and uh, they were flimsy at best. And uh, it was a real adventure to, to fly from place to place on some of these raggedy airplanes where a lot of the instruments weren't working and all that sort of thing. But nevertheless, anyway, we traveled all over the country. We were looking for a place because I had this idea, okay, what do I want to convey to my students? What kind of vision do I want to give them? Uh, something that they can, you know, embrace and maybe hang on to and use for the rest of their lives. And uh, we searched and we searched and we didn't quite find a place. And I was a little dismayed by this. And uh, we came back home and we talked about it. And uh, some of my colleagues said, well, yeah, you need to go down and, and, and visit again. And, and uh, we're going to hook you up with different government officials. And anyway, the upshot of it was I was asked to go down and visit the village of Gales Point. Now, Gales Point was in an interesting political situation. There were two overlapping political districts. And these people were caught in the middle. And as a result, one district would say, oh, we're, 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 the other guys would take care of them. The other district would say, oh, no, the other guys would take care of them. And as a result, they weren't getting anything out of their government at all. They were located on an inland lagoon about 30 miles south of uh, Belize City, which is the, at that time was the commercial capital of the country. It uh, is approximately three miles inland from the ocean. It was located on a peninsula in a lagoon. Let me go back here. The uh, town is right here, 
And uh, the only way into this area was by an 18 mile long dirt track, which to call it a road was a distinction it didn't deserve, uh, or by water. And uh, these folks were pretty isolated. They were descendants of slaves that had been liberated from the British about 200 or so years ago, predominantly African Creole. And there were four or five family names, and depending upon who you talked to, there was anywhere from 350 to 500 or so people that lived there. Now, in 1960, Hurricane Hattie hit the coast of Belize, and Gales Point was devastated. And this is a remnant of Hurricane Hattie, and this was 30-odd years, almost 40 years after the fact. Now, I coined this the sleeping tree because I never walked by this that I didn't see somebody laying out on that tree and they were comfortable and I have to confess I'm a little bit envious of that. This is a characteristic idea. This, this happened to be a new house that was being built there. Uh, they used local materials. Uh, mahogany uh, was a dominant product of Belize for many, many years. It since is no longer dominant, but there's still a lot of mahogany around. How would you like to live in a mahogany house? We think that sounds pretty cool, but to them it's just like pine. It's, it's not that, that common. They scatter their various and sundry possessions around all over the place. This was interesting. This was a restaurant, by the way. This was Mrs. T's kitchen. It's her menu. You have a mini pizza for a dollar, three cookies for a dollar, Two tostados, two tostados for a dollar. You could get fruit leather, pastries and cookies, fresh fruit, whole wheat bread. Classy place. This little house housed a family of six. Six people lived in that. This was the home of the village drummer. Drumming is a big part of their culture. They uh, uh, communicate with drums as part of their uh, their music, and it's fascinating. They, they build their own drums out of a variety of natural materials. And there's an incredible range of sounds and rhythms that they can, can produce with this. And it's utterly fascinating. We had a professor of musicology with us on one of our trips and uh, spent an absolutely delightful time with him recording some of the music. And I think he got several publications out of that one recording session. It was really fascinating. Paint is at a premium. It's liquid gold. And so for so for any kind of paint, any color, it doesn't matter what. You know, if you got it, you use it. And uh, we saw some very colorful buildings. This is another home. And this was, by the way, this is the main drag down through the, the, the town. It's about a mile and a quarter long, and, and people live scattered up and down this little gravel road. Now, as a result of the aftermath of Hurricane Hattie, the uh, World Bank uh, funded the uh, building of this structure. This is a hurricane shelter. And uh, it's designed to uh, uh, take care of the folks in, in the event of a hurricane. They can all come into this, and it's a, uh, a weather, kind of a weatherproof thing. Uh, the lower part of it here was actually the uh, village library. Now, the village library had... I don't know, maybe 50, 60 books that people had given them. Uh, there were a few uh, old magazines, some of them 15, 20 years old, that sort of thing. But it was the village library. And uh, uh, the upper part of this was all open as a uh, kind of a, an assembly hall area. The local village health nurse, when she was there, was located over in this area. And uh, we looked at this and we thought, well, this would probably be a good place for us to set up our, our clinical operation. And I'll get into that in a minute. <clears throat> Again, just another one of the homes there. This was the village post office. All the essential stuff of civilization there. There were a couple churches there in the village and the only thing I ever saw them occupied for was funerals or weddings. Uh, there was a very vibrant uh, small group of people. I never really could figure out what denomination they represented, but they would have a Bible, Bible study on Wednesday nights. 
A uh, little interesting side. Some of you may have heard me tell this story before, but one of the old village elders, a guy by the name of Walter Goff, Mr. Goff was the justice of the peace, and he was a, a, a truly fascinating man. He was very tall. He was almost seven feet tall, and he traced his ancestry to the Nebo tribe in, in Africa, and he was ebony black. He was as, as black as anything you could imagine, and he was a good friend to me. And Mr. Goff and I have spent quite a bit of time talking about life and philosophy and what have you. And uh, anyway, one day we were sitting under the palm trees and we were discussing religion, okay? And Mr. Goff told me, he says, uh, talking about missionaries. I said, you know, the missionaries come and visit. He says, oh yeah, the missionaries, they come, they visit. He said, uh, three weeks ago, the Baptists come. Everybody be Baptist. Then the Methodists come. Everybody be Methodist. And then the Catholics come. Everybody be Catholic. But when they go home, we are what we are. Now, what is that? Well, it was kind of a combination of a lot of different things. And it was fascinating, but a lot of it was cultural. It had been handed down for generations and generations. And it was very, very interesting to see how it worked for these folks. The peninsula that this village was located on was, as I said, about a mile and a quarter in length. It varied in width from maybe 100 yards or so down to 30 feet. And this was the narrowest point of it. And uh, surrounded by water and an absolutely gorgeous tropical venue. Absolutely gorgeous tropical venue. Now, the people. I've alluded to this. This was one of the uh, local matriarchs. Uh, this is Miss Isabel. And again, uh, very, very dark-skinned people. The children were delightful. This, this little kid was uh, half of a set of twins. Uh, her sister had just passed away about a month or so before I took this picture. Um, Childhood mortality was a really significant problem in this particular village. The average woman during her rep reproductive lifetime would have 16 pregnancies, the average. And of that 16, she would raise maybe five or six. They had large families, but uh, for the most part, there was a pretty high infant mortality. Kids were cute. Kids are kids wherever they are, very animated. This old boy was the only American expat in the village. This was Hank. Hank was retired from the US Navy. He was an old rum bird, and then he found his corner of paradise. And Hank was the village handyman. Anybody that had something break, he would try to fix it. And he was a delightful, very peaceful old guy. He, he had emphysema that was a, a, actually ultimately terminal. But he, I enjoyed Hank a lot. He was a, a neat old fella. Now, this was the village council. As I said, we worked through the, the government, both national and local. And uh, I requested, when we went down to, village, to uh, visit uh, Gales Point, I requested a meeting with the village council. And I told them, I said, I don't have any politics. I don't have an agenda. If there was anything that I could do for you that it would be possible for me to do for you, what would it be? And they looked at me. I don't think anybody ever asked them that before. And they were very polite. And each one of these people represented, you know, like public works. Uh, uh, there were different kinds of, of categories, just like any other government would be. And they were actually, in spite of their condition, pretty hip. But anyway, they deliberated amongst themselves there for a few minutes, and they came back, and you notice, uh, sweating. It was 106 in that building that day. Anyway, uh, they deliberated for a few minutes, and they came back, and they gave me a list of eight things. Now, these were problems from their perce perception, their perspective, that they could see, something that they would request help for. Now, at the very they knew I was a dentist, and at the very top of the list, 
They said, you know, many of our people no longer smile. It's because they don't have any front teeth. Do you think you could help that? I said, yeah, I think so. And he said, well, you know, the missionaries come through, and we appreciate what the missionaries do for us, but they take our teeth out, and they don't replace them. They don't restore them. They don't fix them. Do you think it would be possible? to restore the teeth instead of taking them out? I said, yeah, I think so. Then they said, well, we have some other health problems. We have people in our community that have diabetes, and they can't get medications, and they die because of it. Do you think it would be possible to do something about that? Yeah, I think so. And I don't remember what the other lists were, but not once did they mention money. They weren't asking for money at all. So I told them, I said, well, I will go back to my colleagues and we'll discuss this and we'll see what we can do. And that's what, exactly what we ended up doing. We devised a program based on that community at that point in time to address the needs of the people as they saw it. Now, these are some of the other folks that were waiting to be seen in our clinic. This is little Mayan mama with her two little kids. These people would come and they would stand for hours out in that heat waiting to be seen. It was amazing. I thought this was kind of interesting. They, they dressed in their best. This lady had on two hats. Now, most common conditions have allergies, joint pains, headaches, asthma, diabetes, hypertension, parasites, scabies, occasional fevers, cough, various lesion removals, the spectrum of dental problems, abscesses, fillings, tooth replacement, preventive, medical and dental care. Now, lest you think that living in a tropical paradise is without any danger, this is a tropical paradise. And these were very, very common problems. And there are bugs out there that will get you. That's all there is to it. I got off the plane one time in Louisville after being down in Belize, and Betty said she was surprised that they let me back in the country. I looked like I had smallpox. You get off the plane, the bugs would say, fresh meat. And they would attack with a vengeance. But anyway, this was our team on one of our trips. These are dental students that are, are standing there with me. What we would do is we would set up our equipment. Now, we had to haul all this stuff back in, into uh, the village, and uh, it, was, it was a little bit problematic because our conventional dental equipment you know, there are certain things we have to have to do what we do, and it wouldn't work there. So we had to modify stuff. We had to build our own. Initially, when I first got there, the electrical power for the entire country was supplied by five stationary railroad locomotives. George, how many kilowatts of power does an electric locomotive put out? What they would do is they would... They would build concrete pilings under these, these railroad locomotives, and they would run them on diesel fuel. They built a shed over top of them, and they would feed this into the power grid. And what I found was that this, the nominal voltage would run anywhere from 85 volts to 135 volts, depending on the time of day, and anywhere from 45 cycles per second to about 80 cycles per second. Now, I'm gonna tell you something. The equipment and the stuff that we use here won't work on that. It had to be modified and adapted, and so that's what we did. And, it, and we brought the students in on this. They had to learn, I felt, how to do these kinds of things, to be flexible, to be adaptable. And so that's what we did. We, we built a, our own equipment. We set it up, on, as I said before, in the upper uh, level of the uh, Hurricane Center, 
and we operated our clinic there. And once we got set up, the people came. For days they came. Now some of you may find some of these pictures a little disturbing, and I apologize for that, but that is the way it is. And this is what we were contending with. Well, little local kids, just rampant decay. Look at that. Isn't that a mess? This was after treatment, though. Now, I'll show you some, some new smiles. Smiles were one of the things that they were most requesting of. Okay, this little gal was 19 years old, already had three children. Now, she had had a device made somewhere along the way that had contributed to her condition. This was the device, a one-tooth removable partial plate. And she was, a, she was concerned because the teeth were abscessed. They had to come out. There was no way to avoid that. And she was afraid. She told me, she said, I'm, I will be ugly. No man will have me. That was her concern. She didn't want to be ugly. And so we removed those teeth that were diseased, and this was what she was left with, and we repaired the, the one there on the left that was broken down. Now, the very next day, this was totally healed. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And we fabricated her, my dental students did, some new teeth. Made her a happy girl. This was Dilroy. Dilroy was the son of the lady who cooked for us. We were very particular about uh, the food because uh, Montezuma's revenge is a reality, and we wanted to make sure that our team didn't get knocked flat by uh, salmonella or whatever. But anyway, Dilroy was a really cool kid. He was, he was a neat guy. And, uh, but he was concerned about his appearance, and this was Dilroy before, and this was uh, my dental student, uh, Joe Workman. This was Joe's all-night dental emporium and tooth fabrication clinic anyway. He's taking impressions on him, board up the models, Delroy before and Delroy after. A few more cases. I thought this was a particularly nice case. This little Mayan lady came from one of the, uh, the farms around uh, the area. You got her fixed up a little bit. This was Moses. He was one of the local patriarchs. We got Moses fixed up. This, this boy was uh, is an interesting story. His, uh, he was going to school, high school, in uh, Belize City. And... Uh, very bright kid, and uh, but very introverted because of his uh, appearance. And his teacher uh, took up a collection for him, and up to cover his transportation, she had him transported 65 miles to come to us to uh, take care of. Uh, you see, this was afterwards. Okay, now. We worked in the village of Gales Point for about five years, and then we moved on to a new village because the head man of the village of Red Bank came to approach us and wanted to know if it would be possible for us to come down and operate in his area. And uh, we went down and investigated, and uh, indeed it was. Uh, but Red Bank was a different demographic, okay? These folks were all Mayans. There's about four different strains of, of Mayan society. And uh, anyway, uh, this village was not located close to the, to the uh, ocean. It was uh, inland uh, several miles. And uh, anyway, we went down, and this was typical of the housing that uh, this community had. Um, palm fronds and uh, local mahogany they would make uh, posts out of. The Mayan ladies are very, very colorfully dressed. They, they, they like bright colors. And the, uh, the kids were really, really beautiful children. They were a lot of fun to, to work with. 
very, very uh, interactive. They, they weren't bashful at all. But they had the, the same kind of problems that we saw up in uh, Hales Point. The serene beauty is what I, I would describe this as really a kind of a, a neat uh, uh, appearance. Uh, kids were kids, right? Now, do we have fun on these trips? You betcha. This is Joe, again, one of my students. We caught this fish out in the uh, Bear, Bar River. That's a 90-pound Goliath grouper, also known as a Jewfish. And uh, anyway, we, we brought that fish in, and after the... Uh, Villagers got done with it. There wasn't 10 pounds of waste. And it literally fed the whole village for a meal. And I don't know how many of you like fish, but I'm going to tell you something. The barbecue sauce that they made out of mangoes and papayas and grilled that over an open fire, you didn't even have to chew it. It melted in your mouth. <laughs> this was our clinic operation. We'd advanced a little bit there in, uh, in uh, Red Bank. And uh, again, my students in, act, in action there. At the end of the day, the kids would all come back. They loved to play. They wanted us to play with them. And uh, this was one of my students, a guy named Seth Ernstberger. Seth's a big old boy, and he'd throw these little kids way up in the air like that and catch them. They'd squeal. They'd have just the best time doing that. Seth is now an orthodontist over in... Uh, uh, Floyd Knobs area over in southern Indiana. You may have seen these hieroglyphs of uh, Mayan temples and what have you. This lady's hairdo is exactly like what you see on the, uh, the hieroglyphs. This is an interesting story. This guy worked in one of the local uh, banana plantations. And the story was he was walking down through the plants there one day and he got bitten by a snake called a fur de lance. How many of you ever heard of that? Fur, fur de lance. It's the second most venomous snake in the world. Now, he was lucky to have survived this, first of all, because they also, the locals call the fur de lance two step. And the reason is that that's about how far you get after one of them bites you. That's how potent they are. But anyway, uh, because uh, he had uh, some uh, appropriate medical intervention, he was able to not only save his life, but also save the arm. But look at this. I mean, he's got one you know, major blood vessel here and, and you know, the skin overlying, and that's about it. He really didn't have any use of it, but uh, I thought it was really a, a very interesting uh, presentation of that. And this is what the fur of the lance looks like. They're, they're ugly snake. They're about... Uh, all three or four feet long at the, at the biggest, and they uh, are very, very dangerous. And this was, uh, again, a group at, after the end of a, a hard working day. All right, now let's talk about how we love our neighbors, how we show our Christianity. How many of you remember Dorcas? Okay, now... Community services, you know, we talk about that. Outreach ministry. Now, it has many names throughout our churches. We had a very, very nice presentation about ministry, outreach services, you know, before uh, the sermon. And yet, it kind of gets a bad reputation sometimes. Now, this important, and I'm talking primarily right now about Dorcas, this important department, in many congregations, you know, we have this vision of elderly women sitting in a dark corner of the church, sorting through piles of dresses and clothes and all that stuff and putting them in smaller piles and all that sort of thing. And they do this day after day and month after month. And we somehow kind of look down on that. It's not very, very classy. You know, it's not particularly exciting. Now, in some churches, in reaction to the image of outreach, people have abandoned those old-fashioned approaches and reimagined community services in a new way. Some churches did a neighborhood felt needs inventory a while back. 
the idea of, ser of serving the surrounding area became reinvigorated with new ideas about how to serve. <clears throat> For a while, the importance of combating sex trafficking captured the national consciousness. Workshops and ministries in several congregations sprang up to help exploited kidnapping victims. Some churches were involved in workforce training. People in the community need to learn job skills so that those churches had programs for resume building. Some had a children's tutoring ministry. Or maybe with the attention garnered by Nipsey Hussle, you know, the hip-hop guy that got murdered here recently, some have wondered, why can't our church do that? That being giving away clothes. Dorcas, maybe? To, the, to those in need from the, his neighborhood. The New Birth Missionary Baptist Church has made headlines recently for bailing out impoverished people who were in jail awaiting trial. Many don't realize that in the United States, two out of three incarcerated people have not been found guilty of any crime. They're just too poor to pay bail to await their trial at home. Many of them often wait in jail for inhumanely inordinate amounts of time, sometimes years, to be tried for petty crimes and misdemeanors that they are eventually found not guilty of. Now this happened to a young teenager out up in, I think it was in New York, uh, Caliph Broder, who was jailed in Rikers Island. Rikers is one of those horrible, horrible zoos, or, uh, zoos uh, horrible uh, prisons. He was jailed up there for years while waiting trial for stealing a backpack. After three years, he was able to go home without ever having a trial because the prosecutors realized they didn't have enough as evidence. Staying in a rough facility like Rikers is mentally taxing. The slim 16-year-old was physically and sexually abused in jail. Two years were spent in solitary confinement, which only added to the emotional exhaustion. And knowing his innocence throughout those years made him even more distraught. Khalif was eventually released, shortly after which he took his own life. Khalif's story is far from the only one. So bailout programs do important work. Now our church here is involved in the eastern area, Christian ministries and other outreaches. And, you know, I'm glad. I'm glad that we are. Now, we need consistency, however, with these kinds of programs. You know, we can have a program and say, hey, let's go plant, paint the women's shelter. And then we never show up. Let's feed the homeless at Thanksgiving. As if that food will last until next November. It's fine to do these periodic things, but as long as we're systematic and connected to those communities later on. One of the most notable ministries that I'm familiar with in Adventism is out at Redlands, California. This is Loma Linda University Church Outreach Project. They run a thrift shop in a model akin to Goodwill. Now, it may not get a lot of international attention, but it's effectively run, and it's been a stable presence. ADRA, you know, the uh, relief agency, similarly, is a good, they're very good at what they do, and they've done it for a long time and they can meaningfully coordinate with other NGOs and also foreign governments because of this demonstrated stability. Now, we can be gratified in our Christian experience, but it takes commitment. And it may not always be trendy, nor may it always get applause. But nevertheless, we help others not to be revered, revered by humans, but because we're doing God's work on earth as described in Matthew. There are many innovative ways to serve. But whatever we choose, let's be committed to do it all well and do it for the long haul. And on a more personal note, show some human kindness. Let's pray. Our kind of loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful that we've been blessed with living in a country with resources and blessed with the opportunities and the freedoms to pursue our practice of Christianity. Give us each insight, Lord. Give us wisdom. Give us uh, knowledge and the uh, commitment to do your work here in our community and on a larger scale, if it be possible. This I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.